Good evening. Glad that you could join us again on this Wednesday evening as we uh, continue on with our look at the armor of God out of Ephesians chapter 6. Um, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer, and then uh, we're going to read the passage, and we'll get into the last two pieces of armor, uh, and uh, we'll talk about those, okay? Thanks. Father, as we uh, come together, I just pray that you would uh, open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word, that it would help us to be prepared uh, for all that uh, will come at us through the uh, days to come, and that, Lord, we would stand firm on your word and, and stand firm in the knowledge that you will never let us go. Lord, we give this time to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let me read Ephesians chapter 6 again, starting in verse 10, down through verse 17, just to get our minds back on uh, the armor of God and what Paul is really advocating for us. He starts out this, this passage or this paragraph uh, that he would have written in his letter, and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, he has just talked to the church at Ephesus about how they're to live and some of the difficulties they were going to face. And he says, finally, now that I'm closing this letter, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, that tells us that we have an active adversary and he is actively coming against us and trying to trip us up and cause us to have difficulties. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then we'll stop right there, and then we're going to continue on uh, next week, looking at verse 18, how we actually use this armor that we're putting on and what it means to us as a child of the king, as a, uh, a servant, uh, or as a soldier for Christ. Uh, kind of calls to mind that, that old song, Onward Christian Soldiers. Because we are in a battle, and God has given us the ability both to defend ourselves and to go on the offensive uh, should the need arise. So let's look at this. Now, we've already talked about um, several pieces or articles of the Roman uh, uniform or the Roman soldiers' uh, attire as they were getting ready to go into battle. And the first thing that Paul would uh, talk about was putting around your waist the belt of truth. And really, for us, without going into the, the details of the fact that it was studded with, um, with iron around and it had a, a leather apron with uh, iron discs or uh, iron in that leather apron so that it would protect uh, the abdomen and the lower legs. Uh, regardless of that, what it means to us as a Christian is that we needed to be we need to be prepared for action. Now, this was the first article of uh, the uniform that the Roman soldier would have put on in preparation for battle. So uh, this means we, as a Christian, need to be prepared. And since it's the belt of truth. We need to know God's truth, backwards and forwards, uh, all around it. We need to, to know it. We need to hide that truth in our hearts so that when the deception of the enemy comes uh, or is presented to us, we can see it as deception and we can stand firmly on the truth of God's word. He then tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness, not our own righteousness, but a righteousness that comes from God. Now, we know that in the Roman soldier, what that breastplate of righteousness really was, or at least that article of clothing or that uniform article, was uh, composed of two pieces. It had a, a piece of chain mail that would go over uh, the Roman soldier, and then it was a piece of segmented armor, uh, bands of metal, uh, most likely uh, bronze or iron, that, would, that were tied together with le leather thongs, and it would have allowed that that Roman soldier of freedom of movement to be able to fight and or defend himself. 
And you know, I was I was thinking about this through the weeks as I've been going through this, and and we do put on God's righteousness. It's not our own righteousness. It's His righteousness that protects us. But it is also in that righteousness that we find a freedom in Him. We have been freed from uh, the penalty of sin. We've been freed from uh, the temptation of sin. If we will just hold on to the righteousness that is in Christ, if we will see ourselves as the righteousness of God in Christ, then that breastplate of righteousness makes more sense. It, it allows us as Christians the freedom to live for Christ, not to sin, but to live for Christ and to push sin away and to no longer be enslaved to what the world tells you you have to do, but rather you have the freedom to live as God has commanded you to do. And uh, I just like that description. I like the way that that um, that sounds and, and what I think it means when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, his righteousness, not our own. And then he says to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we know that uh, as he's talking about this, one of the things that uh, distinguished the Roman soldier was, was the shoes that he wore. In fact, some of the uh, enemies that he would fight called them the boot uh, soldiers. And so he, they would put on these shoes that were studded on the bottom with hobnails so that they could have traction, that they would not slip. And so um, he tells, put on these feet so that you don't slip backwards, you don't slide backwards. But we know that the preparation of the gospel of peace is the understanding that we have now been reconciled with the Holy God, that we are no longer enemies of the cross, but we are part of the royal priesthood, part of a holy nation, that we've been uh, called together to be his children. And, and so that peace that we understand is that reconciliation with God where we were once enemies, we are now friends and part of the family. And then the second part of that is, as we talked about this article of clothing or this article of the uniform, was that, that the second part of that piece is that we are reconciled with each other, that we have a peace with each other, that we're no longer uh, at odds with each other as Christians. Now, that's the ideal. We need to be that way. We need to reconcile ourselves to one another rather than uh, fight with one another. But anyway, he says, put on the the uh, preparation of the gospel of peace around your feet. And then we talked last week about uh, the shield of faith and how it was made. There was uh, two pieces of wood put together. They would curve it. Uh, they would uh, put um, uh, a uh, cloth, or not cloth, but a skin over it uh, so that it would give it strength. And they would uh, uh, bind the edges with metal. Uh, then uh, they would usually color it with their uh, unit colors so that they could identify themselves. But before they would go into battle, they would soak it in water so that when the flaming arrows of their enemies would, would hit the shield, it would be extinguished. And so when you read to take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one, it makes a little bit more sense to see that. And then we also talked about the fact that the Roman soldier in and of himself, uh, a raid like this was formidable, but not impervious. Uh, if we look at how the Romans organized their units, these shields were specifically designed so that the Roman soldier could help protect one another as they were in a row fighting against an enemy and then ranks behind them, they would hold their shields in front of them, the, the ranks behind them would put their shields over them, the ranks to the side of them would put their shields out to the side, and essentially they would create a human tank as they were uh, going against or fighting against their enemies. And this provided them great protection uh, as they fought. In fact, it was almost, they were almost unbeatable at, at uh, one time until, of course, other tactics caught up with them. But this, the shield of faith, our trust in Christ, is such that um, we believe that God has saved us and that nothing that the enemy can do can harm us. So what we look at as when we put up that shield of faith, we are saying as a Christian, God, I trust you. I trust that you have saved me. I trust that you have uh, created uh, a barrier in front of me that you will, you will hold on to me and take care of me. And so we, we look at that, um, that shield of faith 
as being part of that armor that we put on. And then today we're going to get to two more things. We're going to get to the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit uh, as we look at these things. Now, um, let me go ahead and describe what this helmet of salvation was, or at least this this part of the Roman uh, armor was. Uh, the Roman soldier's helmet was typically either uh, crafted out of bronze or out of iron. And uh, I'm going to talk about this in, uh, as we get to the end, but imagine how heavy that piece of equipment had to be. Just like, just like holding up the shield with those uh, iron bands around the edges, now the shield would have been about four feet by three feet, so that was a lot of metal to have to hold up. Of course, the, the breastplate was also made of uh, metal, either bronze or iron, so that would have been pretty heavy. Uh, but imagine how heavy this thing would have been on the Roman soldier's head. It would have had two cheek pieces to protect the sides of his face. It would have had a, a, an extension down the back so that it would protect the Roman soldier's uh, um, face. Uh, and now, like I said, it was pretty heavy. So what the Roman soldiers would do is they would get pieces of sponge. By the way, you know sponge grows naturally? <laughs> Who knew? I just thought you went to the grocery store and bought it. But anyway, you would, you would get these pieces of sponge or they would get uh, pieces of felt or cloth and they would line their helmets with this so that um, it would provide some level of comfort. Uh, now, in Jesus' day and, and uh, uh, shortly before that, they began putting uh, plumes of horsehair on the tops of their helmets. Uh, and one of the reasons that they would do this is that um, it would make them appear taller or uh, more formidable against their enemies. So, you know, here's the Roman soldier arrayed in his full uh, combat gear, and then he appears 10 feet tall. Uh, so that was part of why the, the plumes began to be put on the top. Um, now, by the time of Jesus, 80, uh, 80 60, or, or I guess the time of Paul, uh, the centurion's plumes would have been colored or dyed various colors to allow soldiers to easily identify who the officers were and, um, and what was their rank. Uh, now, a centurion was a military officer who would command uh, approximately 100 soldiers. Now, it could be either between 60 to 160 soldiers, but, but really the centurion means 100 or commander of 100. Now, just out of curiosity, I'm going to give you just a little bit of time. The New Testament mentions two centurions by name. Find it in Acts 10, and you can find it in Acts 27. You know who those two centurions were? Go ahead. I'll wait. I wish I had the Jeopardy music. Da, 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 da. Okay, time's up. Cornelius and Julius were the two that were uh, identified um, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts. Those were the two centurions mentioned by name. Now, of course, Jesus met a Roman centurion whom he said, I've not seen such great faith because that centurion said, I'm a man under authority. So anyway, the helmet of salvation, uh, how, does that, how does that relate to us as Christians? Uh, first off, uh, the helmet points to God's ultimate victory over the forces of evil because it's the helmet of salvation. Salvation points to Jesus' death on the cross. And so we know that because of Jesus' death on the cross, that salvation is made available to all men. And when we've accepted that salvation, we've put on that helmet of salvation. It is to remind us that Jesus died on a cross, that he was raised from the dead, and that it frees all of us from the bondage of sin. So belief in Jesus provides us with eternal life. And this hel helmet of salvation is there to remind us of that. And so when we put on the helmet of salvation, it is to, to let us know that we have an assurance that Jesus has saved us. That is the assurance of our salvation, not because of good deeds, but because of his mercy shown to us on the cross. When we put on the helmet of salvation, it is also to help us know that every believer is a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. 
And so when we put on that helmet of salvation, it is to remind us of that fact, of that truth, that we are no longer what we used to be, but we have been remade into what we are supposed to be. And we are being remade throughout our walk on this earth. And when we get into heaven, then we will be fully completed as to what God wants us to be. So when we put on that helmet of salvation, we also have to realize that that we're in a battle. That, uh, that we'll be persecuted for believing in Christ. And that we need to keep the faith. And when we do that, when we keep the faith, then we'll be blessed. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so when we put on the helmet of salvation or when we figuratively put it on, we realize that we're going to be in a battle and that there are going to be those that persecute us that are going to come against us. And then we also, we, we realize that we are looking forward to eternal life. It is to remind us that we will one day spend an eternity in heaven with Christ, that our days on this earth are but a wisp and a vapor. They're, they're a short time to know that God will forgive us when we fall and we ask his forgiveness. When we put on the helmet of salvation, we recognize this. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So these are the things that as we put on this helmet of salvation, we're to remember. This is, this is what Paul was calling to mind when he writes to the Ephesian church to put on the helmet of salvation. He would have talked to them ex extensively on what salvation was, what it meant. And so when he says put on this helmet of salvation, they would have recognized that, that they were putting on the salvation that was won for them on the cross through the death of Christ. Now let's come to the sword of the Spirit. Uh, everybody, for whatever reason, loves the sword of the Spirit. Uh, you can go to uh, Hebrews and talks about uh, the, the Spirit of God is uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, dividing the center of both soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And you go on and, and it has a description of that. But Paul, when he says, take up the sword of the Spirit, uh, he was using a um, an iconic piece of equipment that the Roman soldiers had. Now, the Roman soldier, uh, his sword was a called a short sword. It was about two to two and a half feet long. It was crafted from iron. Now imagine how heavy that piece of equipment would have been. It was crafted from iron and as the and as the blacksmiths, now iron can be brittle. So as the blacksmiths were crafting that sword and hardening the blade, when they would get the blade to a, a red hot state, they would sprinkle coal dust on it and that would form a hard carbon layer over the sword. And it would allow it to keep its edge better and not to chip or to break uh, in battle. And so this provided, this innovation provided the Roman soldier with a technological superiority that their enemies didn't really have for many, many, many years, even hundreds of years. And so the, they would make this sword, they would uh, form the handles from bone or ivory or, or wood, and they would go from there. Now, the Roman soldier would carry this uh, short sword on his right side, um, so that, or on his left side, so that he could take it out with his right hand uh, and be able to pre be prepared for battle, uh, and so that he could um, easily draw it and be able to fight. Uh, remember, they fought as a unit. Last week, we, we kind of talked about the fact that the shields were put together so that it would provide protection, but their strength was also in the fact that they fought as a unit. And I said that Christians like to uh, go off on their own. We like to, to stand our own, fight our own battles. But God did not create us that way. He intended us to be together, to, to um, come together, to encourage, to support, to defend, to lift one another up. And so this sword was, was placed such that the Roman soldier could get to it fairly easily and fairly quickly. He would also um, fight like I said, in, in rows, they would keep their shields forward. They would hold the, the, the swords in front of their shields flat, and then they would uh, push them out and, and basically 
uh, forced the enemy back. And when they had a chance, then they would use the swords in an offensive manner. So um, this is the way that they would use the swords. Now, how does that apply to us as Christians? The sword is the only offensive weapon uh, mentioned in Ephesians 6. Uh, God didn't mention the spear. He didn't mention some of the other weapons of the day. He mentions the sword. And so it is the only offensive weapon that they would have carried. Now, all of the other things, the breastplate, the helmet, uh, the shoes, the, the belt, all of those things uh, and the shield were defensive in order to protect against the enemy. And the sword was designed to defeat the enemy's plan and to rescue lives. So when we look at the word of God, when we look at the Bible, it, it means the gospel. When we see that, we see that the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. It is the message that we have salvation through him. The gospel is also the good news, right? And that good news overcomes the darkness. It is the light and it overcomes the darkness. It, it is what reminds us of the abundant life that we have and the life that we'll have forever uh, in the Lord who loves us. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can use that, but in John 1.1, 1, 1, we need to understand. This is part of understanding the truth, but it also becomes part of the weapon that you use to defeat the enemy. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And so we see that as we look at this word of God, it is what Jesus used to defeat Satan. Look at Matthew 4 uh, and then verses 4, 7, and 10. Every time Satan uh, tempted Jesus or uh, tried to put something out there, Jesus would always answer with the word of God. Something that came from the Old Testament which also tells you the Old Testament is the gospel as well. It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now remember, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. So when Satan attacked him, he answers with the word of God. He answers with uh, the weapon, the only weapon that was going to be there to defeat Satan, which is the word of God, which is the truth of God. And then when uh, he uh, talks about uh, testing Jesus, Jesus answered in verse 7. He says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then when Satan stood him up, uh, over all the world and said, all of these things I'll give to you, he says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Remember, Satan said, I give all of these things if you'll just fall down and worship me. And he answers with the word of God. That is why the sword of the Spirit is a weapon that we have in the battle against uh, what Christ is, or what the world is trying to bring against us. And so uh, as we look at this, how do we use this? Now he says that we're in a spiritual battle, that we're uh, in spiritual warfare. He's, he's talked to us about putting on this equipment, which by the way, um, I might add, it was very, very heavy. I already talked about that, right? Uh, and before I get into how do we use this equipment, uh, I think I want to do, I think what I want to do is, is talk to us about preparation. Uh, and we'll probably end with just the preparation tonight and then talk about how to use this equipment uh, next week. The Roman soldier would have put on this equipment. And when you begin to think about it, it would have been uh, a lot of weight. Even the shoes, if they have uh, iron hobnails put in onto the bottoms of, the, of these shoes, those shoes would have been pretty heavy. I don't know if you've ever, uh, remember the ankle weights that you used to get when you'd work out? You could put them on your arms or on your, around your ankles and it made your feet heavier and it's supposed to uh, help you get in better shape. Well, imagine putting on shoes that have uh, pieces of iron uh, attached to the bottom of them. Now, iron is pretty heavy. And so imagine trying to walk with that. It, it would have taken a lot of effort. And then to put on this belt of truth that would have had pieces of metal uh, attached to the leather strips or the leather apron in order to provide protection, that would have been heavy. And then to put on this breastplate of righteousness made of iron and put on the chain mail made of iron, it would have been heavy. And then to take up the shield and to take up the sword and put on this iron helmet would have been extremely heavy. Now, 
that means that the Roman soldier had to train. He had to prepare himself physically to be able to use this uh, armor, this this uh, equipment that he had in order to go into battle. He could not just simply put on the armor and go into battle and expect to be uh, victorious uh, without a lot of training, without a lot of physical training, to be able to pick up a sword made of iron that's two and a half feet long. That would have been heavy. And to be able to hold his head up with this uh, iron helmet on or, and to hold his sword and or to hold his shield and to, to carry all the equipment that he had to carry... Um, it probably was, was well over 100 pounds. And that, that's a lot to have to carry into battle and to be able to move and to fight and to do those things. And, and as a comparison today, a, a U.S. soldier, when they're uh, in the Army, when they're fully outfitted to go into battle carrying uh, the um, body armor that they carry, uh, the ammunition that they have to carry, the weapons that they have to carry, the helmet that they carry, all of these things, many times... A soldier's equipment going into battle can be well over 100 pounds. They carry a lot in their backpacks. They carry a lot uh, in their pockets and, and in web belts and different things. And so here they are prepared for battle. And that's why physical fitness is such an important part of uh, being in the U.S. military is because you have to carry all of this equipment into battle and be able to fight and to, uh, to win. So let's take that into our spiritual fitness. Paul is telling us to put on this armor of God. Well, in order to be able to use this, we have to be spiritually fit. We have to spend time in God's Word in order to learn the truth of God's Word and to be able to, to hide it within our hearts. We need to understand as we spend time talking with God and praying with Him and, and, uh, and just... Uh, having a relationship with him, understanding the assurance of our salvation or recognizing his uh, promise that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. All of these things mean that we as a people of God have to prepare ourselves for the battle that we are already in, whether we want to be in it or not. And so as a church, we have to come together to open God's word and to learn it. We have to come together as a body of Christ to to. Uh, help one another and we take a brand new recruit, a brand new Christian, someone who has just given their life to the Lord, we have to take them underneath our wing, we have to become disciplers to them, they have to become a disciple in order to learn, we have to spend time mentoring and training and, and teaching them what the truth of God is so that they can stand firm against the the adversary, so they can stand firm against these spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenlies, so that they can stand firm and not lose their, their faith, and that they can be a part of the body of believers. And so, why is it that we don't like to study? Why is it we don't want to open God's Word? Why is it we don't want to come to church? Why is it we don't want to spend time in Bible study? Why is it that we, already in a battle, God's children already marked out uh, by our adversary to be harassed, to be persecuted, to, to be uh, uh, taken down. Why is it we want to go into battle without ever having trained ourselves in order to be able to use the weapons that, and, the, and the armor and the equipment that God has given us? I don't know, but we are in uh, spiritual warfare. Let me leave you with a couple things. And we'll talk a little bit more about them next week as we, as we talk about how we operationalize uh, this armor and what God has given us. But because we're in spiritual warfare, you need to, and if you have something to write down, write this down. You need to put God first. Christ says in, in Colossians that he must come to have first place in all things. There can be nothing else before Christ. And nothing can keep you from, from following him. You have to recognize when he says, you'll know that they love me by how they keep my commands, that we are putting Christ first, seeing him as the commander of, uh, of his church. He is overall. And we need to be a truthful purpose, or a truthful person. We need to 
as we put truth around our waist, we need to be truthful ourselves above reproach. We need to realize that how we act towards people uh, matters, that, that perfect love drives out fear. We don't need to fear the world. We need to, we need to show love to them. Love is an action, not a feeling. Okay, so we need to be patient and kind and, and generous. We need to keep no record of wrongs. We need to, to uh, understand that this perfect love that God has shown us should drive out the fear of our living for him. We need to have confidence. We need to have strength in that breastplate of righteousness realizes I have no righteousness of my own, but, but God's righteousness goes before me and protects me. I can have confidence in that. The helmet of salvation reminds me of what he did on the cross. I can have confidence in that. It, it helps me to recognize who I am in Jesus. We need to be kind and we need to be patient with one another. When we shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we realized that peace has been made between us and the Heavenly Father that, that we were once separated from. And now <laughs> we are to be reconciled to one another. We are to have peace with one another. And part of that is a fruit of the Spirit is to be kind to one another, to be patient with one another. That means we have to put up with one another too sometimes. I know that's kind of hard, but it is. What it is, we need to we need to put up with each other and recognize that not everybody is at the same point in their spiritual journey. We need to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit as we fight the spiritual battle. It is not against flesh and blood, it is not against those that you can see, but it is against Satan and his spiritual forces of darkness that are against us. We need to rely upon the Holy Spirit in order to fight this battle, which means we need to spend time talking with God. We need to take our cares and concerns to Him. We need to be content that God is going to provide for us, that he's going to watch over us, that, that he is with us and never is going to lead, is never going to lead us, leave us. We need to follow God's way. We need to do what he's commanded us to do, live the way he's commanded us to live and recognize that God wants us to have life. These things are, are ways that we can fight against the spiritual warfare that is being brought against us. We need to avoid gossip. We need to keep confidentiality. We need to realize that God offers forgiveness even when we stumble and fall. And he commands us to forgive those that may have hurt or harmed us. He calls us to forgive. He calls us to live. He calls us to love. These things help us to fight against the spiritual warfare that is against us. And the armor of God is to remind us of the equipment that we have and the truth that we have and the life that we have in Christ. We'll pick up uh, next week and talk a little bit more about spiritual warfare and uh, the most potent tool that you as a Christian has against the spiritual warfare. And that is to spend time in prayer, giving it to God. Let me uh, pray for us. We'll be dismissed. Thank you for coming. God bless. Father, as we uh, close this time, I thank you for the opportunity to open your word. I thank you for uh, the truths that we find there, the, the uh, absolutes, the, um, the, the things that you tell us, Lord, that you'll never leave us, never forsake us, you'll never let us go. Father, all of these things that we know that your son died for us and that he took away our sins, that if we confess our sins before you, that you'll take them away and that you'll forgive us. And that, Lord, you give us uh, the strength to carry on. Lord, we know it's not in our own strength that we can uh, fight this battle, but only in yours. Lord, I pray first and foremost for each person listening to the sound of this message that we would put Christ first in all things and never let that uh, falter. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.